true science, you know, true scientific inquiry, investigation, experimentation is really just an exploration of spirituality. Because it's like from the quantum level to the gross level of matter, all of that is consciousness expressing itself. And consciousness could be synonymous with the spiritual realm. Like there's nothing here that's not the spiritual realm. So to investigate the world of form through the scientific method is actually just investigating one spectrum or one expression of consciousness. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Field Tripping. Today, we have fellow podcaster with us, Luke Story. We chat about good and evil, addiction and sobriety, self-love, and more. Before we get started, here's your reminder to subscribe to Field Tripping updates so that you never miss an episode. Towards the end of the episode, we'll go into our how-to segment where listeners can call in and ask a question for me to answer. If you have a question about mental health, psychedelics, or anything we've chatted about, drop us a note at fieldtripping at castmedia.com or leave a voice recording at speakpipe.com slash fieldtripping. And as always, if you love the show, leave us your thoughts in a review on Apple Podcasts. It's much appreciated and helps us reach new people to help educate them on psychedelics. Your thoughts help us a lot. Now it's time for some news to trip over. While ketamine is a remarkable antidepressant, it is also an effective anesthetic that is commonly used for surgeries. But what if a patient with depressive symptoms undergoes surgery during which ketamine is used? A recent systematic review of such cases suggests that there is an antidepressant effect up to three days after the procedure. The patients in these instances were anesthetized, so in theory, they didn't have any conscious drug-induced experiences. Still, they tended to experience benefits, implying that there is an antidepressant effect from ketamine that is not dependent on the drug experience itself. While these short-term antidepressant properties may not rely on a conscious experience or psychotherapy, it's likely that the enduring effects of ketamine are maximized when ketamine administration follows the psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy model. Speaking of ketamine-assisted therapy, a recent study completed by the company Awaken found that ketamine is an effective treatment for alcohol use disorder. Order. The study's findings showed that ketamine, when combined with therapy, resulted in total abstinence in 162 of 180 days in the following six-month period, achieving an increase in abstinence from around 2% prior to the trial to 86% post-trial. The results for relapse at six months showed that the ketamine plus therapy group's risk of relapse was 2.7 times less than the placebo plus alcohol education group. Finally, a big announcement out of Field Trip this week. We received a notice of allowance for our patent for FT-104, our novel molecule in development. This is a big milestone for us because it confirms that FT-104 is novel and has utility, at least in the U.S. Patent Office's eyes. And unlike organizations that are pursuing trials for psilocybin and MDMA, this will give Field Trip a right to commercialize FT-104 without competition for a longer period of time, probably in the range of 14 years by the time we get approvals to market it. There's been a lot of discussion around IP in the psychedelic sector, and while we recognize that some of the concerns are legitimate, we feel confident that what we've invented with FT-104 is truly novel and meaningful, and we're incredibly excited to keep moving forward with it. Now, on to today's conversation. I'm here with Luke Story. He is a writer, teacher of meditation, metaphysics and biohacking, lifestyle design expert, founder of The School of Style, and host of the popular Lifestylist podcast. Lucas spent the past two decades refining the ultimate wellness lifestyle, and his personal experiences with addiction and recovery, as well as health and wellness, have led his path down sharing his wisdom through media and mentorship. His teachings combine primal health and ancient spiritual practices with the most cutting edge natural healing and consciousness expanding technologies. Luke, thank you for joining us today, and welcome to Field Tripping. So to begin, Luke, this is probably long departed from your memory, but you were 
actually the first to ever guest we booked to be on this podcast, Field Tripping. It was back in March of 2020 after <laughs> Ben Greenfield oh was kind enough to make an introduction. Uh, but like a day or two before we were supposed to record, I chickened out because I had no idea what the fuck I was going to talk about on a podcast and I canceled last minute. Uh, just So to start, Please accept my apologies for the chicken shittery, a term I just coined while preparing for this podcast uh, like for the that. last go around. Like and second, uh, with my first question for you, you know, you've gone through a lot and, and it seems that your life has gone through a lot of evolutions. What gave you the courage, uh, speaking of courage, to strike out on your own and build the business that and lifestyle that you've built to this point? Well, I think it's just that I spent a long time in a career uh, which was working as a celebrity fashion stylist in Hollywood. It's totally random and a a completely (laughs) really long and probably not interesting story, but uh, I dressed celebrities for a living essentially. And the entire time I was doing that, that was about 17 years uh, in my free time uh, and even longer than that, I was pursuing spirituality, consciousness, and um, all things physical health, which has since been coined uh, biohacking, but it used to just be you were a health nut, you know? But uh, I had a lot of uh, profound struggles with addictions as a kid and into my 20s. And when I was 26, I was fortunate enough to be struck sober. And um, part of that was just getting into detoxing the body and fortifying the body and... um, going to India to learn meditation and doing all the things, right? All the yoga and every spiritual book and self-help book that I could digest and sitting at the feet of teachers and just absorbing information so that I could transform myself. Meanwhile, kind of having this double life where during the day I'm running around trying to find the perfect pump for some actress in Beverly Hills, you know? And it was a fun, it was a fun career. I mean, I always kind of put it down because it, w- it wasn't ultimately my purpose and it was just something I, I fell into as a broke musician. And um, I was kind of living that double life. And so in all of my downtime, I was doing breath work and kundalini yoga and ice baths and all of this stuff. And then wake up in the morning and play the Hollywood game uh, about which I was not passionate. And then um, I formed a business in 2008 uh, called School of Style that's uh, well still a business to this day all these years later, where I would teach people how to do what I did for a living. So it's a school to teach you how to become a fashion stylist, essentially. And, um, and it was a great business. And I found that I was really passionate in the teaching and lecturing part and just putting together the courses for the first 12, uh, 10 years, we did live classes all over the country. And then uh, in 2018 or so, we went online. So I had some familiarity with content marketing, content provision, uh, events, and got quite skilled at public speaking doing that. Uh, And in addition, uh, or at least so I think, (laughs) people pay me to do it. So there must be at least a few other people that think I'm okay at it. Um, Self-proclaimed expert speaker. Uh, (laughs) But I was also um, part of a 12-step group uh, for, you know, a couple decades and did a lot of public speaking there. And um, I think that I really kind of grew my uh, my skill for speaking to the students in a way that I could convey information. And then in my addiction recovery program became, I don't know if skilled is the right word, but I learned there how to speak from the heart and to really convey authentic, vulnerable truth. And so I'm working as a fashion stylist just kind of doing it for the money, frankly, because I had no other skills <laughs> you know, that were viable. And and it was fun and creative and sometimes exciting. And there were things about it that I liked. Um, but it just got to the point where I didn't want to do either of those things anymore. Uh, run that school because I'm teach I'm I'm passionate about teaching, but I'm not passionate at that point about what I'm teaching, right? And so probably due to my lack of self-esteem at the time, I didn't really I'm just on the journey learning about myself and exploring consciousness and evolving spiritually, right? That's my number one mission in life and still is. And because I'm always kind of looking at the next thing to work on, it took me a while to realize that by that time, I, by the time I started my podcast and doing speaking and things like that in 2016, I was a bit slow to realize that I had actually um, accumulated some wisdom in those years. 
And people started sharing with me as I would go to see these speakers at conferences and listen to podcasts, people started saying, why don't you do that? And I'm like, oh no, little old me, I couldn't do that, you know? Well, you, you know, you have a lot to offer. And I thought, do I? And so uh, once I became convinced that I had, had enough to offer to perhaps create a platform out of, you know, what I was, the things that I had learned and integrated and also kind of an ongoing sort of immersive journalism approach to my path, um, I, I just kind of threw caution to the wind and um, lucky, luckily had that business that helped fund the launch of the brand that is me now. But I, in one fell swoop, just quit my styling career, started a podcast. And, um, and from that podcast, all sorts of other opportunities availed themselves, um, especially in the public speaking and holding workshops and things like that. And it was, um, it was not easy. Now it's easy because I, I'm so on mission and I, I'm just so aligned with my purpose that um, making a career, making a living out of it is is really secondary to what I do. You know, it's yeah. the more I focus on just serving and helping people and improving myself in all the ways, um, it seems to pay the bills. But I was fortunate where I had a, I remember I took, I took like my um, kind of expense, personal expense budget from that business and used that to pay my podcast producers and things like that for the first year. Um, so I paid to produce my own content and disseminate it in the world for quite a while before I started to actually be able to, you know, monetize what I'm doing, so to speak. Um, but like you, when you when you you know went to launch your podcast, it was really scary, especially interviews were easy for me um, because I just love learning um, and I maybe have decent people skills. But what the the roadblock for me was the first episode because that. I don't know. It's somewhat traditional if you're a host that your first episode is where you kind of tell your story. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I remember writing out this kind of a, a manuscript and just bullet pointing some of the, the, the touch points in my life and things that might help um, give people an understanding of who I am and what I'm all about. And that was terrifying because I was faced with the prospect of um, having to decide how vulnerable and revelatory and personal I wanted to be. And with my past and addiction and things like that, which I talk so freely about now, that was for me kept very private. I didn't run around music video sets being like, hey, I'm a recovering heroin addict. You know what I mean? It's just that I was even sober or anything like that. And that was such a huge part of my story. It was really the impetus for my whole journey was the suffering around that particular um, era, which was much longer than it should have been. Um, and then I said, you know what? I'm just going to. I'm just going to go all out and just be who I am. And maybe a few people will be helped along the way that relate to the struggles that I've overcome and, and even the ones that I'm still um, working on, you know? So that was kind of how it started. And I guess it happened in perfect time, but I do look back and go, wow, it's so crazy that I did something for a living for so long that I, I had to really work so hard to muster up a passion for and an interest in. Whereas now it's like my passion for what I'm doing is just boundless. And it's more about like actually containing it to keep myself focused so that I have some sort of a, a plan, you yeah. know, about what I'm doing. Because I just, I'm like shiny thing syndrome. There's so many exciting things in the world and especially in the realm of psychedelics and plant medicines. I mean, it's just, I feel like we're in such a renaissance as a species and um, I'm just on the wave of that. So it's it's like now more reeling myself in than feeling any sort of contraction in terms of how much I want to put myself out there. It's like, I need to put myself out there less. So I'm sitting here at my desk more often, you know, yeah. working on the 3D nuts and bolts of the whole thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, th there's a, a beautiful synchronicity that exists in this, which is you were supposed to be the first podcast guest on the show and then I chickened out. Uh, and now you're actually the last podcast guest on on this season and, and probably this formulation of the show. and your story times perfectly with some of the struggles that I'm dealing with right now, you know, throughout the podcast and just in life in general about like, what is my value? What is my wisdom? You know, where do I get my self-esteem from? And so it's, it's, it's kind of really nice that this loop kind of closes with you as the guest. Um, so, so thank you for being here and, and thank you for sharing that. I was struck, um, pun not intended, but it's appropriate that you said you were struck sober um, when you were 26. Why that choice of words? 
Well, I think I frame it that way because I think that I had very little to do with it. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the part that I played in it was having um, sort of a buried, uh, buried, buried, a buried seed within me of potential. And I saw at the very end of that period um, in my 20s that there was just this ever so slight chance that I could make something of my life that would hold more value and meaning. And because I had, and which actually, interestingly enough, came to me in a totally unconscious, unintentional, unplanned mushroom ceremony a few months before I checked myself into rehab. Okay. And, I, and on that note, I'll digress for a second. It's interesting. I had blocked out that memory or not identified the correlation there or perhaps even causation um, to some degree of that medicine experience until I was probably 22 years sober and had then gone and done ayahuasca. And I remember at some point thinking back on like, you know, why didn't I ever have any awakenings when I was using psychedelics as a teenager and in my 20s, which I was, (laughs) it's a really bad idea, but I was trying to escape from the pain of being me by using psychedelics. And I thought, I wonder why I'd never had like a spiritual awakening, right? Because so many people um, have that transpire. And, um, and then I was taken back to that night and I realized that I, I had sort of a mini little nervous breakdown uh, in, in this mushroom journey, which was also accompanied by all sorts of other drugs and, and stuff. Um, it was very murky waters uh, that evening, but uh, that was the night when I realized to myself that it was going to be time very soon to get sober and that I, I just, I couldn't live the way I was living anymore. So that was like the seed was, wow, I should really be sober. I have no idea how to do that. And it's a terrifying prospect and one that I had much aversion to. But that was my first contribution to it. And then um, perhaps some applied courage to actually be willing to sequester myself away in a treatment center and go through the steps necessary and um, the bravery to know that if I were to do that, that there was going to be at least one day I was going to wake up without my anesthesia. And then um, I think the rest is mostly a gift. And that's why I, I framed it that way of being struck sober. It's, I was gifted this depth of surrender that enabled me as, I wouldn't say I was an atheist, but agnostic uh, at best. <laughs> and I started praying the first day in rehab. I mean, that's all I was given. That's the only tool I was given. I wasn't given any medication to wean off all the stuff that I was on. I, I, I tried to get it and they said no. Um, and they recommended that a course of action would be to go back to my room and get on my hands and knees and pray. Hmm. And I thought, could we maybe get some Dilaudid instead? <laughs> you know? like pray. Um, and, but that's what I did. And, um, from that moment until this moment today, it's God in a, in a few short weeks, it'll be 25 years since I've used any addictive mind altering substances. And, um, I'll add the asterisk there, um, addictive or, you know, patterned, um, substances, I, I might say, um, you know, we can get into that, but I really was struck sober. There was a gift that had been bestowed upon me. Um, where the prayer that I had so uh, so humbly and earnestly submitted before this ambiguous higher power that I was seeking to build a relationship with, or at least to be granted some reprieve from my suffering, um, even though I didn't believe in that God that I prayed to, it still extended its omniscient, benevolent, power and love uh, in and on my life. And from that moment until now, I've never ever had the thought or a craving to use drugs or alcohol. I've been addicted to a lot of other stuff, you know <laughs> what I mean? And, had, and, had, and, and applied the same formula to that. Like, okay, I give up. I've had enough. Yeah. White flag of surrender. God, please take this from my life or show me how to do it. Give me the power to do it. I'm, yeah. I'm willing to do my part. And, and, you know, I think that's the thing with addiction, why so many people have such a 
terrible time escaping from it is is it it does require so much humility and so much willingness, all these principles of the 12 steps really, um, in, in order for the barriers and armor of the ego and the intellect to be, um, to subside enough to allow the grace of God in, you know? And that, and that was the thing that I guess I did. But even that, you know, if I'm honest, that sense of humility and that willingness to seek the help of a higher power, even that is a gift, really. You know what I mean? Even even that was given to me. I, there's a lot of people I've known over these years that um, never got even that gift, let alone the gift of having those just nonstop cravings and obsessions um, of addiction be removed. You know, it's mm-hmm. just they can't even get to the point where they go, okay, I don't know how to run my life. Maybe there's something out there that can help me, you know, because the the pride and the close-mindedness and the arrogance of most alcoholics and addicts is insurmountable. You just, you can't get past the armor of like, it's everyone else's fault. I don't have a problem. Even if I do have a problem, it's my problem. Don't tell me what to do. I'm going to fix this myself or I'm not going to fix it because I'm fine and everyone else just needs to leave me alone. You know, this total deflection of responsibility and self-honesty um, and the powers of self-deception that most um, addicts have is it's 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 really a phenomenon it's insane and for anyone that's never struggled with addiction or known someone uh, you could watch the show uh, intervention <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's on anymore I used to love watching that show because I'd watch it and just be like oh thank God <laughs> thank God you know I thank God I had the grace that I that I was given um, to get out of that but you, you can watch a show like that and just go it's so obvious to the viewer that everything in that person's life that's causing them and and the people around them pain is completely of their own doing, you know? Um, So to just, to get to that point where you say, you know what, I, I did this to myself, A, and B, I, in and of myself alone, using all the willpower I can muster, can't beat this and see that I'm, I'm willing to consider, not believe, but just to consider, to just crack the door open, that there could be some sort of creative force in this universe that might hear me if I ask for help and might guide my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors to create a life that is free of addiction. So that, to me, it was something that just happened to me. I was just, I, I allowed myself to be in the right place at the right time and create the circumstances around my thought processes um, that would facilitate that um, that grace to enter into my life. And, and it did. And so for the past 25 years, I've been asking the question, who was that? Who is that? Where are you? Can I have more of you? Can there be less of me to allow more of you in? Call it God, call it what you may. And applying really that same formula to any problem I have in my life of just like, okay, I'm willing to do my part and exert whatever willingness and effort that I need to and ultimately know that the results of those efforts are up to this greater intelligence that has so um, brilliantly designed this human experience of duality. And so it's just like, how, how, how much deeper can my surrender go? And out of that surrender, what am I going to be guided to do with my time and energy? Thank you for sharing. Um, a couple of, of questions uh, kind of come out of that. Uh, the first one is, let's start with the, the maybe easier one to answer, maybe not. Uh, what was the answer to that question of who, who is this? Who are you? And, and I'm sure it's an ongoing conversation, but where are you in the conversation of who was that that uh, it had that divine inspiration in you? You know, it's it's interesting. I think, of course, it's impossible to define or explain, and that that's what makes it fun, right? Because <laughs> you can you can never pigeonhole this thing we call the creator, right? It's just like I think what's happened for me is the the frequency bandwidth of that energetic being 
has just gotten wider and wider over time where it's not so much like who is that or what is that? It's more like what is not that? Hmm. And there's nothing left other than that. So I think in the beginning, it was like, not that I had a deity to pray to or something like that, but it was, it was like there was a separation between me and that God that I was seeking communion with. Mm-hmm. And so there was, there was a me over here and a God over there, and there was all this stuff blocking us from having an experience or a relationship. And so I sought to remove all of those blocks so that I could get closer to that one thing. And that's evolved into the awareness that it's all only one thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the, the thing is everything, the block for everything. I'm everything. We're all everything. And there's nothing that is not by design. And so then it's about building the awareness around when I start to believe in the separation again, Mm -hmm. which is essentially when I fall back into the density of duality and start seeing myself and God as separate or another person from myself as separate or my environment, nature as separate. And that sense of false autonomy and isolation between myself and consciousness. Like, oh, consciousness is over there. I got to go get some rather than just, wow, what if I really just embody the consciousness that I am? And then there's no longer such a a hide and seek game with finding God because it's not finding something. It's just actually acknowledging what is here. There's, there's no, there's not like a spiritual path and I don't have to be a spiritual seeker. I just have to be a spiritual acknowledger right? right? Yeah. of just letting go of pretense and all of the things that make the 3D material world seem so real of just allowing that to be as it is and just sitting in the knowingness that there's nothing that's not God, including myself. And on a, on a good day, there's there's moments of that. And I would say over time, there's longer durations of that. And shorter durations of believing believing the simulation that that it's all separate and that it's all compartmentalized and that God's in this but God's not in that and that you know I have to go chase this thing called God so that I have some um, sense of ease in my life mm-hmm. and it's 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 dude it's crazy because it's the formula is so simple but <sighs> It's like the patterns that we build to be able to cope with our reality using our senses and being in a body as souls, the patterns are so ingrained, the patterns of separation, and and even add to that the kind of the psychological constructs that we've built around religion or around spirituality, around a me and a God and all these sorts of things, it it is dense and it it takes increasing levels of surrender. And I think also study, that's something that's been really big for me is just going to so many lectures and just hammering my intellect with truth and knowledge and podcasts and audio programs and books. And just, I mean, I'm still this way. I was listening to Alan Watts podcast this morning. It's like, and every, every time I listen, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that thing. Or, or I didn't know about that thing, right? It's like the same things being said over and over again, but there's, there's so much programming and maybe even, um, maybe even inherited programming of just the human condition through my lineage and just the, line, the lineage of all humanity. There's, there's so much of that to kind of weed through to just get to the ultimate um, truth, which at this point to me presents itself as there's only one thing and that thing is consciousness. And my life and my sense of well-being, success, and happiness is 100% dependent on at what stage or level of consciousness I'm able to exist. And the higher that consciousness can be, meaning just closer to love of love, meaning capital L, not romantic love, but just unconditional love of being alive and love of the experience that I'm having, 
the closer I can get to that, um, the more ease I find I'm able to um, experience on a day-to-day and moment-by-moment basis, you know? But that density is always there waiting. You know, you just step out into traffic and it's like, oh, I'm a person again. Yeah. So it's kind of like the game for me is kind of walking between both worlds and and acknowledging that if I was meant to be a celestial angelic being at this point right here today, I would likely not be in a body anymore and I would be some sort of interdimensional guardian angel of sorts or who knows what, right? The people but that the fact people that I'm meet in, on the DMT. Fact, <laughs> The fact that I'm still in a body tells me that part of the game is being here and doing the earthly thing and playing the role of Luke's story. Um, And as long as I don't fall too far in either one of those worlds, I seem to be able to function and and, and also um, have a continued experience of, uh, of my version of sobriety, you know, which is not being in any kind of active addiction or taking any kind of substances that would dull my consciousness or awareness of spirit. There's so much in there. Um, I guess I'm going to start with saying, uh, you know, my, my wife, Stephanie is kind of going through the same thing and she's kind of landed on, I think starting with the pandemic has really forced her to confront a lot of things. And she's kind of landed in that, that zone and that belief of, you know, we're all part of this universe of consciousness. We're all part of love. Um, and to me, it sounds amazing. You know, it sounds really lovely. But then I get into that, you know, disbelief of like, if that's true, why why is it so fucking complex? Like, why is it so hard to navigate between the two? It just like it yeah. runs up against my intellect, and and so I try to lean in, and then my like ego comes in and says, "This is stupid." Like, it just makes no sense. How have you kind of? suspended your disbelief because at, at some point along the way you had that disbelief and um and, and I think many people I think the vast majority of people do although I do think that is starting to shift and and that's a really great thing. Well I think one of the huge blocks to self-realization and to having an experience of God <clears throat> is the very difficult reconciliation of why evil persists. And so we think, well, if there truly is this benevolent creator, why would this creator create social strife and suffering and wars and torture and rape and pedophilia and God knows what, right? And that is um, a huge stumbling block until, at least for me, subjectively, this has been my ongoing experience, until I expand into the possibility, again, that it's not that these fluffy unicorns and rainbows over here are God, and that famine in this other country is not God, so I need to stay with God so I don't have to experience those things that I... Uh, categorized as not God, rather than that, what if I let go of the idea that the world needs to be changed at all? What if this world is created with su- with such perfection th- that it allows me such a broad spectrum of experience and such a boundless playing field of learning and evolving opportunities. So I can come into this world, I can be born in a ghetto or born into an abusive dysfunctional family lineage. I can be at the lowest level of consciousness uh, where I rob, steal, I'm violent. And via my own spiritual will, because of the vastness of contrast that's available to me in duality, I can in one lifetime go from that to being a saint. If we didn't have the contrast and the polarized side of duality that we view as evil didn't exist, there would literally be no reason to be here. If you subscribe to the idea that what this thing is about is going to the material plane uh, to an incredible school that's full of uh, infinite lessons and possibilities. So it's like 
if the world was completely free of all things that I would perceive as evil, I would have no spectrum of consciousness in which to evolve and elevate and grow. And so if the world was meant to be that way by this creator, then the world would be that way. And it would be an angelic realm where everything was just unbridled expansion of love. Right. But because it's not, <laughs> it makes me feel a lot better to know that it's all by design. And right. so if it's by design, what's the purpose? And the purpose to me, just logically, even intellectually, let alone like what my spirit feels and intuition feels, is that this world is exactly perfect for a soul to enter and to have such a massive opportunity for evolution because of that contrast. Great. And, you know, I don't know if I'm like a boy whistling in the dark and that just makes me feel good or that's the way it really is, but I find that that gives me a much higher perspective when I find that I'm getting pulled into the density of the quote end quote problems in the world, right? I can look at everything that's gone on over the past two years, which is at times terrifying and all the time shocking. <laughs> you know, what, what we've allowed to transpire is just mind boggling. Yet, if I, if I zoom out to that perspective that both sides of the spectrum of what I would view as good and evil are playing their roles. I mean, speaking of leaders and just policy and legislation and the medical system, education system, all these systems, financial system of the world, that they're all so perfectly cast with good guys and bad guys. I mean, it's like we literally live in Star Wars. And it's, yeah. it's just so perfectly scripted that there's, there's actually a beauty in that. And when I see it that way, it doesn't absolve me of wanting to be one of the good guys, right? Of contributing compassion and love and service to the world as best I can, however imperfectly. I don't think, well, it's all like this on purpose, so I'm going to go out and start harming people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, 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 not or not stand my ground to those that I believe are, right? It's like there, there is born out of that um, a sense of integrity and a sense of duty for all things good and all things love. But I find that I'm much more effective in making that contribution when I'm not vilifying and condemning God or the players on the other side of that duality as being anything other than the way they're supposed to be. So I might think that there's a, a diabolical character named Anthony Fauci and I, my ego is just like, God, I want to see him in prison. I want to see him hung because I, I believe that he's harmed a lot of human beings. I don't know. That's my perception. But that person is playing their role with such utter perfection, right? Because that person playing their role on what I would deem diabolical and evil is giving me the perspective and the opportunity to go in the polar opposite direction. If I deem that as evil on that side of duality, well, what's the other side of that? If we're going to play the duality game and just pretend like I'm separate from that entity and that that entity should be acting some way other than they are, according to my rules of the world, what if I just allow them to be who they are and I just keep elevating my consciousness and trust and hope that by me doing so, that whatever portion of this ocean I'm in, all ships will rise. In other words, I, I don't need to fight the evil or fight the darkness. I just am invited to make my light brighter and to make all the light around me brighter. And I think this is the thing that many of us don't want to assume responsibility for because it's much easier to vilify the other side or blame God for allowing evil to uh, perpetuate. It's much harder to heal your relationship with your mom to do shadow work, to, to heal your core wound, to forgive the person that abused you, um, to even just put some real effort into 
opening your heart in your day-to-day interactions with people at the gas station and the mortgage broker you talk to on the phone and you know the landscaper outside that's making noise that you want to go hit in the head because of his leaf blower. That's my big trigger, <laughs> the leaf blower. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, what, if, what if I spent the energy rather than trying to change the world? What if I spend that energy just t- to change my consciousness and my perception of the world and in so doing, make every effort and every minute interaction, thought, feeling, deed to contribute love? You know, and if I really want to change the world, I mean, it seems that's the best way to do it. But that that way doesn't give the ego any juice because then there's no one to fight. There's no more villains. There's no more bad guys. There's just there's entities and humans, perhaps both. (laughs) Really, (laughs) I don't know. It's another conversation. Um, There's these energetic beings on both sides of the equation. The scale of like good and evil, right? And 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 this creator's. sort of monopoly game that's been created or chess maybe rather. And it's like, rather than trying to convert these guys over here on that side of the playing field or on the board, what if I just keep doing my thing over here and just trust that this is the greatest contribution that I can not only make for those about me, but it's truly the biggest contribution I can make for myself. Because then my perception starts to expand and I start to see, oh, okay, I get it. Like, this is all a bufo journey. Like, you know what I mean? Just, this, is, this is all a game. And in one sense, it's not even real. It's real, but it's not. I mean, the material world and the melodrama of the human experience. Man, the more I can lean into that, the more I can actually be here in the 3D and pay the bills and do my work and have a body and pretend like I'm normal. But there's, there's a bigger part of me that's kind of tethered to consciousness as a whole. And that's really in love with the whole thing, as as terrifying as it might be at times. Mm. There's kind of a, you know, as I said, a, a 30,000 foot zoomed out view that's like, oh no, I don't need to change anyone. I might not even need to change myself, but perhaps rather than trying to change myself and wrestle myself into being someone or something that I'm struggling to, um, to um, um, achieve, that perhaps it's like, I just need to become more awake and just higher, higher mind, higher heart, higher being, lighter body, laughter, fun. It's like, what if, what if I could just laugh at this whole thing that some people call a pandemic? Yeah. It's like, not laugh at the people that have been harmed by it and things like that, but I mean, in terms of like my anger toward who I think is responsible or my fear around how it or they could harm me and all of that. What if it's just like, I just keep my head down and I just keep doing my work on myself and bringing along anyone who finds that path intriguing. I have zero interest in talking about COVID and going into the politics of it at all. Um, But I did want to use the example of Anthony Fauci. Um, which is, again, without going into the specifics of it, how do you reconcile that in his heart and in his head? Um, and I believe that he is acting with what he believes to be the best interests of those around him. Um, how do you reconcile that your worldview and, and the higher level uh, of, of love and, and goodness um, how do you reconcile it with that that notion of evil, even though that in his world, in his view, I, I'm making an assumption about his perspectives, but I genuinely believe he's not actually intending to do harm, um, that he's doing the same thing and, and, and they're very different. Absolutely. I think that, I want to uh, figure out how definite I want to be in this statement, but I, I think I can stand behind this for myself I think that in any given moment, every human being is truly doing what they believe to be the right thing. And that could be said of Hitler, Mussolini, Mao, (laughs) all of them, right? These These are humans that have created and held themselves to certain ideals and their ideals to the vast majority of people, especially the people that have (laughs) succumbed to their ideals, would say, 
bad idea. But to that person, what they're doing in every moment as they wreak havoc on their society or uh, someone that, you know, uh, commits an act of violence or perpetrates rape or something on someone, like even that person on a one-to-one cause and effect relationship is doing what they believe to be right at that time. And that gets really interesting because then it's like, well, do then are they absolved of guilt? Then where do we find justice when a, a vast swath of people disagree with that person's perspective that they're doing what was right? Because right and wrong are um, subjective. You know, then it becomes perhaps perhaps um, is that person objectively causing harm. It's like a democratic um, spiritual evaluation, right? Like, could you take a Mao and could you get enough people on the planet to say, yeah, that was the right thing to do, right? <laughs> Probably not. Could you get a Hitler? Definitely not, right? I think more people are aware of Hitler than, than Mao. But I mean, just to think of like, wow, these genocide, what we perceive to be genocidal maniacs. So then it's like, okay, if everyone's doing what they determine to be the best course of action and their actions cause great suffering, how do we stop them without, you know, how do we not condone their behavior? And that to me goes back to the same thing. I believe this Anthony Fauci, just to take any one of the people I view as ghouls in the world who are doing much harm, whether they need to or not, it's A, not my job to stop them, B, it's my job just to help people and to keep doing my work. It's going back to that fighting fighting the darkness and rather than just working on the light. And some people would see that as spiritual bypass. But within working on the light, I've, I've known in my life, in my journey, there have been times where the highest expression of my true self and the highest expression of my love is to fucking stop someone in their tracks. Right. Very firmly and and without negotiation just you're gonna fucking stop now what you're doing is wrong period and that could even i mean it hasn't in my experience but could even be a a, a righteous anger or a righteous almost self-defensive violence in some cases right so it's like yeah that that person is doing what they believe to be right and in my own integrity I believe so deeply and inherently that what they're doing is harmful to people that if I was in the position to have to stop them, I would. So say someone breaks in your house and they're going to kidnap one of your kids, right? Well, hey, they're just doing what they believe to be right. No, you, you, there, there are appropriate actions that one can take in the name of, uh, of true good, of, of actual love and perseverance or survival, right? But that, that again, to me, that's like going, I mean, it's so nuanced and it's like, it's a million ways to look at all of this, but totally. I'm just sharing like how I reconcile that again with like, well, how could, if there's this loving God, okay, in and out of religion, it, that's generally the depiction, right? Of deities and avatars and gods. It's like, oh no, they're just here to do good. Well, then how could they allow these maniacs to persist and why do these maniacs even exist well it goes back to that it creates a spectrum so i can observe someone who's harming large groups of people and i can either hate them or i can go wow let's be as opposite of that as we can <laughs> you know what i mean it gives me perspective it gives me contrast it gives me like oh yeah uh if i ever get any ideas like that i'm definitely going to not entertain them and fulfill them as actions I- i'm going to keep doing doing my work. So it, it's interesting though. I mean, it's very nuanced because I, I really don't think a human being's will can motivate them to take action that they don't believe is the right thing to do. Now, where that falls short is they likely in those situations believe it's the right thing to do for themselves selfishly, for their own desires and aspirations, or they might just have a misguided ideology that says, no, this is what's right for the world. We need to purify this race or whatever kind of maniacal idea they're acting out. But I, I do think inherently that uh, 
you know, again, not to, not to condone wrongdoing, but I really believe everyone's innocent. You know, it's like everyone is literally doing the best they can, however misguided and wrong they might be. Right. And it doesn't mean they're innocent that there shouldn't be retribution or justice if, if those people need to be removed from society or need to be held accountable for their actions. But those are also spiritual laws that are built into the system, you know? Um, justice is a spiritual principle. Yeah. And, you know, there are repercussions for one's actions and who enforces those and how are they done so humanely and all that, I don't know. But it seems to me, just broadly speaking, that... Um, the checks and balances of the spiritual world are very real and they're identifiable and they are sustainable and effective. It's just, you know, again, a matter of like, well, who, who gets to choose who's the one implementing these, these rules and laws, right? And in a sense, no one has to because consciousness itself does it and we call it karma. Right. You know, no hair on your head will be uncounted or something like that. I believe it says in the Bible or somewhere, right? It's like, Consciousness knows everything from all time. Consciousness has no beginning and no end. And there really is no now to speak of. There's no present moment. It's just one big endless infinite moment. And everything is recorded. Every thought, every deed, every emotion, everything that transpires in this known universe is on record because in one sense, it's actually still happening. <laughs> if you take out clocks and calendars, it's all just, it's all now. It's all a, a big now. and so when I find myself going, oh man, I hope they get that person and throw them in prison and send them to Guantanamo Bay. It's like, I don't even need to wish for that because the, the hell that, the hell that, I, and I don't mean hell like biblical hell, but just the hell that one is inviting upon themselves by knowingly inflicting harm on other people is a hell that I can't even imagine experiencing you know, having done a, a fair amount of, of medicine work, I mean, I've had glimpses of my own shadow, which isn't even that gnarly. And it's, it's not somewhere I would want to spend any time, you know? Um, so we do what we can logically to prevent people from harming other people. We do our own work and we let God sort out the rest. You know? expression, kill them all, let God sort them out. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally, <laughs> totally, yeah. Do you ever find, I've got so many questions, uh, but I don't want to spend too much time belaboring this. Do you ever find a conflict between science and, and your spirituality? And then how do you reconcile that? True science, you know, true scientific inquiry, investigation, experimentation is really just an exploration of spirituality. Because it's like from the quantum level to the gross level of matter, all of that is consciousness expressing itself. And consciousness could be synonymous with the spiritual realm. Like there's nothing here that's not the spiritual realm. So to investigate the world of form through the scientific method is actually just investigating one spectrum or one expression of consciousness. Right. Where we get hung up, I think, is in pseudoscience or scientism and materialism, nihilism, where one branch of what we would broadly call science is in denial of or ignorant of the fact that all form is an expression of formlessness. And then we get caught up in sort of a hamster wheel of trust the science, trust the science, trust the science, right? right? That's that whole scientism thing. Where if I can't see, touch, feel, hear it, it's not real. Or furthermore, um, if I don't think it can be real, then it's not real. Yeah. Which is the, lim the limitation of the intellect, right? But totally. I think true scientific inquiry is anything is possible unless it's empirically proven not to be so. Right. I'm gonna and and some, things, some things are not possible, right? There are, there are limitations to the material world. There are things that can be done and things that can't. But I think true science is, is broad and open-minded and inquisitive and curious and intelligent. And whether it knows it or not is just 
exploring the dance of form coming out of the formless. There's certainly a, a, an element of ego involved in, in modern science. There, there's no doubt about that. It seems that intention and design go hand in hand. So with this being our first podcast actually of 2022, I'm curious to know what was your resolution for 2022, if anything? Oh my God. You know, it's like, I, I've read a number of different business books and I kind of have my finger on the pulse of entrepreneurship and productivity and just achieving goals and things like that. And everyone says, oh, you got to write down your goals constantly and every quarter, especially every new year. Yeah. You know, write it down. If you don't write it down, it's not real. If it doesn't go on the calendar, it's not real. And this year, man, <laughs> I've just, I bought a house out here in Austin almost a year ago and um, we're just in the middle of the most insane renovation. I mean, everyone said, oh, all renovations are insane. And I'm like, <laughs> no, you don't understand. This is like 11 months that was supposed to be four months. Um, so normally in December, I would take time off, be reflective, start thinking about what you know, what I've accomplished in, in the different realms and then think forward. You know, what do I want to see in my life and what do I want to manifest this year in, in a concrete sort of focused way? And I just did not have the opportunity to do that. It's just like, I've been running and gunning. I think I took Christmas day off maybe. Um, but I, I think, you know, other than deeper intentions and just the, the inner work and inner experience, uh, what this year about for me on, um, on uh, the kind of the manifestation front is having a kid, okay, uh, with my with my wife Allison nice. uh, to fill this beautiful big house that we've been building with laughter and dirty diapers and crying Amazing. and uh, you know that's what so I hear, uh, which has been for me something historically I've been extremely afraid of uh, just being a dad having a kid I've been fiercely independent since I was like two. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just so in love and I'm so interested in having the most full, rich experience of being a human that I can, um, that uh, we're really leaning into that. So I'm hoping cool. that that comes to fruition and um, done a lot of work around the fear. And now I'm actually um, pretty excited about it and and feel that it's not even, you know, like, oh, that'll be cute to have a kid, but more like it's it's really part of my purpose here. So that's pretty huge for me on on a lot of levels. And then uh, I'm have st started working on a book uh, last year, and then you know moved after 32 years in LA to Texas and all of that, and then working on the house and all these other things. So it's like it's been kind of coming together piecemeal. I mean, it took me like a year basically to finish the proposal, <laughs> just because I've done some of the writing, but the proposal is I I learned in my first book experience here that the proposal is so gnarly, <laughs> way harder is way harder for me than the actual book part. Yeah, uh, but I would like to see um, you know at least lining up um, the avenues to get that book out and 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 completing writing it and you know assuming it'd probably come out the following year. So birthing two things, you know, birthing a kid and uh, and birthing a book, and. I think those are those are so big they've kind of eclipsed some of the other you know um stepping stones of what I want to accomplish and things like that but just finishing our house and really creating um an amazing healing sanctuary for our friends family and community and and our future family and uh and finally putting everything I've learned in the past 51 years into a book, you know, into something tangible that I can be like, here, here's the whole thing so far. Yeah. Um, is, is really exciting to me. And um, I, I don't really do a lot of writing in my day-to-day -day life. I used to write like the intros for my podcast and stuff. And I you know, handed that off a few years ago. Um, but once I sit down and do it, I actually really enjoy it, like long form writing. And um, it turns out I'm pretty good at it too. Cool. I think I, ha I have a gift for it. There's many things I'm not gifted in, but writing seems to be one of them. And so it always feels good to do something you feel like you're competent at, right? Yeah. I'm like, I get afraid of writing like all authors and writers do, the writer's block, all of that stuff. Um, resistance, as Stephen Pressfield calls it, very real. Mm -hmm. But like once I actually sit down and touch the keyboard, I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I, and I read it back and I go, shit. I'm I'm moved by what I just wrote, which is a good sign. So 
I think that's what uh, 2022 has for me is just, you know, homesteading and book writing and, uh, and also continuing on with the rest of the stuff I'm doing. I just launched um, a blue blocking eyewear brand called Gilded. Yeah. G-I-L-D. You can find that. By the way, shameless plug, Gilded by LukeStory.com. So that's really exciting to kind of have my own uh, first product. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be working on expanding that this year because blue light is something I'm really passionate about in the health space. And uh, other than that, man, hopefully just kind of recovering from this past year of renovation hell, frankly, yeah. um, and reframing that experience as something positive and educational and just getting in our house, man. I can't wait. Uh, are, are you shipping to Canada with Gilded? Because I wouldn't mind getting my uh, hand. I hands think on we do. Bear. Okay. I think. I think we do. Yeah, yeah, we do. I think we do ship to Canada and we have prescription and okay. readers and we'll soon have kids as well. Oh, cool. Awesome. I think, yeah, it's funny. Like now, now that I'm working toward having a kid, like so much of my content and stuff is around kids. I'm preparing myself. So like researching organic bedding and, you know, EMF free baby monitors and stuff like that, kind of preemptively learning about that side of, um, of alternative health and biohacking yeah. and stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of great stuff coming out in the kid realm. It's exciting. Cool. I, um, uh, I guess late last year we had Michael Pollan on the podcast and we had a great conversation oh, and, um, one of the reflections I took out of that conversation is that actually children are the ultimate psychedelic because they take whatever you give them and they meet you exactly where you are. Um, and if there's wow. nothing more psychedelic than that, then uh, I don't know it. So you're you're in for a, a treat. You know, it's got its challenges for sure, but there's a, a lot of love and a lot of wonderful things that, that go with it. Oh, and that's great. I think the biggest thing is that you don't understand what life was like before you had children. Like it, it really does. <laughs> at least for me, create like a demarcation point beyond yeah. which or before which it just like it almost didn't exist. It's kind of funny. You know, that that reflection is universal amongst parents and especially fathers that I talk to. Because I all my friends here have kids. I mean, everyone seems to be in a relationship and have kids, uh, kind of the age group, I guess, and just people that have converged on Austin or family oriented for whatever yeah. reason. So I'm always quizzing the guys like, how does this work? How does that work? What's it like? How do you still do your thing? You know, all the, all the questions that a, um, a, you know, to be parent would have. Um, and everyone says that same thing, you know, but overwhelmingly, and I think this has helped me really lean into it is every man I know who's a father has expressed the sentiment that their kid or kids have been their greatest teacher, but not just in a sort of trite way, but like, no, like real teacher, like the teacher, capital T, capital T, right? Where yeah. there's there are gifts awaiting you. This is what they tell me, essentially. Um, gifts awaiting you that you have no idea even exist. And that to me is exciting. That's, yeah. that's, what, that's what gets my curiosity peaked, you know? It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. I think I kind of got this figured out a little bit. Let's let's see what's beyond this uh this level of veil, you know. Totally. Totally. Um my my resolution for 2022 is actually to work on building my self-esteem and and you touched on fatherhood and I guess that's really what we're talking about here and and one of the things that um you know, I've been learning is that a lot of self-esteem comes from the father. From the mother comes unconditional love and from the father comes self-esteem. That just tends to be the way things happen. And it seems that, you know, while I've had a lot of courage in some respects, being able to launch businesses and psychedelics, starting after a failed attempt, a podcast like this one, um, despite all the discomfort it had and still has for me, uh, the last couple of months of 2021 really shined a spotlight for me on just how flimsy my self-esteem actually is. Um, what, what in your mind is the best way to build self-esteem? Uh, you know, it seems like you've gone on this journey yeah. quite, quite a bit and I'm starting to learn and get a, get a sense of some ideas. And I think it really comes down in a lot of ways to evaluation, but what, what advice would you give to me about how to build self-esteem and self-love if you've got any? Oh, that's so, that's so good. You know, I think this is something that most, if not all humans face at some point. I mean, I, I think unless you had, you know, the ideal mother and father, like you just described, right? You're just getting affection and unconditional love and warmth from your mom and your dad's like, go get them, kid. You can do anything, you know, unless you're getting that all the time, you know, I think many of us 
suffer from self-doubt or, or you know, just a, a low valuation of ourself, two things come to mind for me because this is something I've worked on a lot. I've made some progress. I think still when I see this come up for me is when I fail to advocate for myself and to stand up for myself, to speak my truth, to uphold or create boundaries with other people. Yeah then I kind of root down underneath that. Well, like, why am I allowing that to happen? It's like, oh, because you don't deserve to be heard. You don't deserve to have autonomy, et cetera. Um, but I think I've made progress in terms of how few fucks I give truly of what other people think of me. Like other people's perception of me generally holds less sway than it did in the past. And, yeah. and that's continuing. For me, it's just like, how do I carry that into when I need things to get uncomfortable and confrontational in my life? That's when I find that I recede a little bit and um, feel disempowered. But it ultimately, I think, stems from the same thing. You know, um, What's helped me immensely is, I think, first and foremost, the acknowledgement that's like, wow, I've not loved myself as much as I could have. Um, why is that? What is it that I've that I believe to be falsely wrong with me? How do I believe myself to be flawed? And, and what is the root of that? What experiences in my past um, gave me the message that I was unlovable? And for me, they're, they're very clear and obvious. <laughs> There's a few huge punctuation points in my childhood that you know uh, helped me to arrive at that uh, false assumption. And um, you know, then, so that's kind of like the inventory of like, okay, where is this coming from and rooting that out and working on healing that. And then the other side of it is more on the proactive side of just, God, how, how can I start to build into my mindset and um, into my habits, like self-care? I mean, not self-care, like going and getting a, you know, a foot rub, which it could be inclusive of, but self-care in terms of like, no, really being in my heart and being in my body and truly appreciating the relationship I have with myself. And also um, within that, expanding on the perspective that every version of myself at every age that I've ever experienced in this lifetime is still in me and part of me. It's not like, oh, that was five-year-old Luke and this is 51-year-old Luke. And that was a different entity there at five. No, that five is still right here. I still am that five-year-old right? It's like mm -hmm. Russian dolls. You take them apart and you just keep finding another one inside. I think you could take a 6'2 person like me and Russian doll me and you find me as an infant coming out of the womb, you know? Right. And so it's, mm -hmm. um, it's an, an acknowledgement and an active love affair with all versions of oneself. And within that, um, the experience is imbued with deep forgiveness of, of one's mistakes, right? So it's like part of that inventory of like, ah, where have I gone wrong? What am I doing wrong? That's harming my self-esteem. And then the converse of that is, God, how can I just shower myself with more love? Like proactively in a um, reliable way, build into my um, thoughts and feelings, how much I love all parts of myself and all versions of myself and yeah. kind of reparenting oneself. You know, I've had this experience so many times in medicine ceremonies where it's like me as my adult self of being more self-realized than I was at any point prior in my life because it keeps growing in that capacity. But to really go back and find these points at which I was stuck before and really bring that version of myself back to my body now and just envelop those selves with love, right? And it's those touch points and those mistakes I've made or harm that's been perpetrated upon me that I blame someone else for as the perpetrator. All of those, you know, core wounds from the deepest to the more superficial is to really go back and just be with those and sit with those as the adult in the room now, right? That it's like, no, I'm, I'm here now, little Luke, medium Luke, medium to late Luke, current Luke. We're all here together, not to sound schizophrenic, you know, but we're all here together. And how can I love all of those parts of myself? Yeah. And um, this is something just ongoing for me. Oftentimes when I meditate, um, usually at the end, I'll just kind of, I'll, I'll have self-talk to myself. That's just like, dude, fucking good job. <laughs> 
that's to me, that's the most loving thing I think I'd say to myself is I'm like, man, you're doing great. You're doing great, Luke. All, all of you Luke's in there, y- y- you know, y- you made some mistakes. You've struggled. You've definitely hurt some other people unintentionally along the way. Maybe a couple drivers on the freeway intentionally, you know? <laughs> um, I've never been so maniacal that I've actually, you know, harm someone in a meaningful way, but you know, we, we're, we're clumsy. We stumble through life and shit happens. And, um, you know, while we want to be accountable and, and make amends for those things, it's like, I think within the amends within of making amends to myself and also acknowledging how I've harmed myself and sort of apologizing to myself, if that makes sense, you know, Mm -hmm. like, God, I'm sorry I did that to you. I'm sorry I put you in that position. You know, it's sort of like a observer witness consciousness who is the overseer of my relationship with myself. And from that part of myself or that vantage point coming into some of the lower realms within myself and giving love and acknowledgement and acceptance and saying, man, you're doing good. You're, you're okay. You've made so much progress, you know, and, and putting some energy into, you know, the flip side of humility, right? There's, we think of humility as, well, don't be conceited, you know, be humble, be small, right? But there's another side of humility, which is really just the converse side of ego that tells me I'm less than rather than more than or better than. And what if I could actually explore a fuller expression of humility where I actually rise up to be as big and fucking awesome as I am also. You know, it's, it's, it's false humility to downplay someone's gift. So maybe I could take a compliment better. Right. Not let it go to my head, but just go, yeah, you know what? I am badass. And I still have some work to do, right? <laughs> in, in different areas. So the self-love and self-esteem, and it's so multifaceted. And um, I think mine, for the most part, you know, the improvements I've made have really been informed by plant medicines. Um, in those experiences, you know, I've gotten to go in to the depths of my wounds on such a deep level and do so much foundational healing. That's what's left when those parts of myself are healed. What's left is just self-love and self-compassion and self-forgiveness and just, you know, an embrace of oneself, even physically at times, if not metaphysically, and just saying, man, you're okay. You're, you're worthy. You're so deserving of love. And, and the last thing I'll add to that that's been really helpful to me is when I'm with someone that I deeply love, like, like um, my wife, Allison, that just walked in, I look at her in such divine perfection when I just observe her, when I experience her, even if she's having a moment, you know, like all humans do, there's this perfection and this innocence and this, this boundless beauty and depth. And I look at her and I'm just in awe. And I have a sense she looks at me in the same way. What if I could look at her, someone that I love and, and, and honor as deeply. What if I could actually reflect that point of view upon myself? Because I am that also. Otherwise, I wouldn't have eyes to see it. Right. I'd be like, oh, that's, yeah, there's that lady. She's, she's pretty, <laughs> you know, or whatever. But, yeah. you know, the fact, that I, the, the fact that I can pick up on her profound gifts and, and uniqueness means that there's something in me that resonates with that to where it becomes visible. Yeah. The expression of it that I see within her is being expressed within me just by the celebration of how I experience her. And so more of that, you know, and that does take, it takes a little bit of effort and fine tuning. And it's not just something that automatically happens because you got a big paycheck or you got a bunch of followers on social media or some superficial verification that you are indeed lovable and, and worthy of being here. It's an inside job. It's got to come from the depths of my, my being that says like, no, man, we're here. You're brilliant. You're great. And also let's keep getting better. Well, uh, on that note, I'm going to offer a compliment that you, I uh, hope you receive, which is you have been a wonderful podcast guest. 
as, as well as your, your wife, Allison, who was a wonderful podcast guest. So I, I want to express my sincere gratitude for you joining us today and being on the podcast and sharing your thoughts yeah, and, thanks and your for vulnerability. It's been, it's been really uh, amazing. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and uh, I've learned a lot. So thank you. Yeah, likewise, man. Every once in a while, I stop and think about our place in the universe. We live on a tiny rock in the middle of an almost incomprehensibly, almost incalculably large amount of dark, empty space. And when I lean into that thought just a little bit, it becomes incredibly uncomfortable just how seemingly insignificant each of us are. The only possible conclusion that I come back to is that we, meaning all life on Earth, are here for a reason. Otherwise, the existence of existence itself makes no sense. There has to be some form of consciousness that is able to perceive the universe, otherwise there is no purpose to the universe, or frankly, even the fact of the universe. Existence needs to be experienced or documented in some way, otherwise there will be never any trace of it. And before you start getting too worried that this line of inquiry is going to go far off the deep end of the Wu scale, hold on. I'll try and bring it back to some level of rationalist thinking. And keep in mind that, as batshit crazy as some of these thoughts sound, quantum physics theories suggest that matter exists only in a state of probability until observed by some other force. So what I'm talking about is kind of scientific, actually. Why am I raising these points? Well, because in my conversation with Luke, that's really what he's found. He's leaned into the idea that there is something higher on a deeper, visceral level, not just on an academic one like I'm prone to do. And I really, really respect that. But it also caused me a different level of discomfort because I'm worried that the spiritual path can often lead people to ignore science. Though I haven't quite crossed the chasm of spirituality with conviction that Luke has leaned into, I'm quite certain that whatever the reason for our existence, we need to integrate emotion and spirit with logic. That's the unique element of the human experience in my mind. As Tom Robbins says, it doesn't matter how sensitive or how damn smart and educated you are. If you're not both at the same time, if your heart and your brain aren't connected, aren't working together harmoniously, well, you're just hopping through existence on one leg. And frankly, I'm a little bit worried that there are too many people hopping around on one leg these days, one leg or the other. My sincere hope is that Luke and others like him have both feet firmly planted, but I suppose only time, whether it be linear or just a figment of the human mind, will tell. Hi, Ronan. My name is Abby, and my question is, um, how do I go from being a traditional therapist to a psychedelic therapist? Um, I'm currently pursuing a career in mental health and also in school as well, and I'd love to know um, the important differences between psychotherapy and psychedelic psychotherapy protocols. Um, thank you very much. The author Mark Twain once responded to a question by saying, I was gratified to answer promptly. I said, I didn't know. And truthfully, there's some of that going on here right now, which is I'm not a trained therapist and I'm not a trained psychedelic therapist. So what I'm sharing is based on my limited knowledge, uh, but I am happy to share it with you. I think the most significant difference between traditional therapists and psychedelic therapists is by and large, most psychedelic therapists have experience with psychedelics. It is truly an ineffable experience. It is so hard to articulate what it's like to go through a psychedelic experience without having gone through it yourself. And so I think if you speak to most psychedelic therapists, they would identify the need for experiential training. Having the psychedelic experiences that your clients are going through is one of the essential components to being an effective psychedelic therapist. Beyond that, I would suggest that the key considerations are, are proper training. There are a number of different organizations right now offering psychedelic therapy training specifically, such as the California Institute for Integral Studies, which offers a master's, I believe, in psychedelic therapies. Uh, MAPS offers training for MDMA-assisted therapy. And of course, we at Field Trip offer training for ketamine-assisted therapy as well. There are other organizations such as Fluence and, and others, but... Uh, Field Trip, MAPS, and CIIS are certainly the most prominent, so I'd suggest you look into training uh, around those. Otherwise, I think the most important thing to being a great therapist and psychedelic therapist is just a whole lot of empathy and care. And if you bring that to the equation, I'm sure you will do incredibly well, 
whether it's just in traditional therapy or psychedelic therapy. As a quick reminder, you can record your how-to question for us and we'll play it on the show. Just go to speakpipe.com slash fieldtripping or you can email us your questions at fieldtripping at castmedia.com. That's cast with a K. Also, please follow, rate, and review our podcast and sign up for our newsletter at fieldtripping.fm or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening to Field Tripping, a podcast that's dedicated to exploring psychedelic experiences and their ability to affect our lives. I'm your host, Ronan Levy. Until next time, stay curious, breathe properly, and remember, every day is a field trip if you let it be one. Field Tripping is created by Ronan Levy. Our producers are Conrad Page and Amanda Elliott, and associate producers are Sharon Bella, Alex Sherman, and Macy Baker. Special thanks to Cast Media, and of course, many thanks to Luke Story for joining us today. To stay in the loop, check out the Lifestylist podcast and visit his website, lukestory.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Click the subscribe button to my left to never miss a release and click here to check out past episodes. See you next week.